Did I come under? Because you have to get to the next round, you have to come in under six minutes. Did I beat everybody else's time? Yes. Uh, who, uh, who are your uh, customers, and 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 how do you reach them? Okay. At this point, customers might be professional photographers or maybe an agency that manages photographers. Um, part of what I want to do, I build a working prototype of this system. So the next step is I want to refine the prototype to analyze what it costs to deliver the service. And so I'll make some of the marketing decisions at that point, like who could afford to pay for this and who has need for this service. But we're probably looking at professional, either professional photographers or, or agencies that manage a lot of you know, digital media work collaboratively. How do you find them? Well, that's a good question. And uh, I'm not a photographer, so I would have to build relationships, probably starting with local photographers, and just reach out from there. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of you know advertising I could do, but I know this is kind of maybe seems cart before the horse to people with marketing experience. But I, I prefer to build out the service and analyze the service first, and then identify the market. Probably not the right answer for the marketing guys in the room. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know, I know. But, but I, can't, I can't make promises to people that I can sell them a service until I'm sure it works. So we're kind of we're at the prototype phase of this project. So I'll be clear on that. Okay. It's an iterative process. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Bill. Yeah. Mark, thank you. Uh, so what what differentiates you versus say just using Dropbox? Well, first off, uh, Dropbox isn't going to allow any collaborative features. So. A lot of the a lot of the stuff that I was talking about that is kind of native to Google Drive isn't going to work on Dropbox. Second of all, I, I would love to see you try to upload two terabytes of photos to your Dropbox account and call me back in three years when you're done doing that because the personal storage accounts like you're talking about are different from public cloud storage account and the main difference is you don't have tools to upload large amounts of information to those personal accounts like Amazon Photos, Google Photos, Dropbox, any of that stuff are really designed for consumer use. So not only will you probably never get your photos up into there if you're talking about a large amount, but if you're just talking about you got a few hundred photos laying around, you know, knock yourself out, you can put them in Drive, that's no big deal. But if you're talking terabytes of information or hundreds of thousands of photos, those little sync gaps are going to fail. They're not going to fail. Yes. So you built this system for your brother, is it mm -hmm. brother? That's and, right. And, and so you, felt, you saw the need there. And <coughs> have you, so and you're in the prototype, and you just built it, and now you're wondering if other people need this product. Have you uh, searched the market to see if there are any competitors out there in this space? Or I haven't, this? you know, I haven't done a lot of market research, and again, I know the marketing people are all grinding their teeth here. Um, I want to make sure that what I build works. So I'm more of an engineering type of person versus a marketing type of person. So I want to build it and make it work. I've had two terabytes of data to play around with for two years in my brother's collection. So I've, I've got, I'm very comfortable with a lot of how this works and how it's delivered, but I'm really not a photographer. So I really need to reach out to people. And like I said, start with the local community, get some photographers involved, and have them tell me, well, I already use this or I use that, and I can compare services but the strength of this system is that it's not a proprietary standalone service, which is what you're probably going to encounter with a lot of these. It's built on top of Google Apps framework. So any business that's already using Google Apps that needs an archive management solution for digital photography is going to be able to, I can deliver this as a managed IP service to them. So I'm not building a proprietary standalone service, I'm actually building on cloud architecture uh, services that may already be used. So I might actually target Google Apps users first that do a lot of media management, because this will work for anything. It doesn't just work for images, it works for everything. Um, and then work from there. So uh, you know, I might kind of, you know, to answer, kind of come back to your question, I might actually not target photographers first. I might target, uh, organize this as a business document management system and target businesses. Have you put a price on it yet? way away from that. Part of, part of the phase two of the prototyping, I collected some cost data during the first phase, but the first phase was pretty much 
building stuff and then doing it again and again because it didn't work right the first time. So, you know, I collected pricing information the first time around, but it's, it's not very clear, you know, to me. So what I want to do is get the prototype running again and then build out specific services and say, this is what it costs to run the virtual machine instance, this is what it costs for the storage, blah, 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 break down the cost and then move forward. Uh, way too early to set the price on it. Yes, Britt. So, um, this is just kind of a suggestion, but uh, thank you for presenting. It was really good. You kind of broke all that down really fast, so mm -hmm. good job there. Um, so, you're saying you're trying to find photographers, but you built it for your brother. I'm assuming he's probably connected in that market, so maybe can he, like, use it, and then I'm sure there's photography magazines and blogs and journals and stuff, and he kind of push it for you. That's true. Well, my brother's kind of a unique case because he's not very technically literate, neither him or his partner. So I've actually had, it's been a challenge to me to get them excited about what I'm doing to kind of participate and help me test it because they're they're just more interested in going and taking pictures of birds. It's you know? a hobby. Yeah, it's a, it's a hobby. Like I was saying, he's an amateur photographer, so I'm not going to get the same kind of feedback. And I might not even want to target photographers to start with. This is this is a simple, you know, I wanted to simplify the presentation so it's a very simple concept to present. But there are also probably going to be a lot of amateur photographers or amateur slash professional photographers that, that are going to want to pay like 10 bucks a month or something ridiculous that I'm never going to be able to hit that, that price point. Um, so that's part of the phase two of the prototype is going to be like, you know, if, I, if I'm actually using this for this service, do people want it that way or are they happy just to upload all their stuff to Photo Bucket anyway or whatever they're, you know, whatever they're doing? Yes, sir. Okay, so, um, all right, so I get it. But here's, here's my question. So or walk me through this. So I've got a lot of data files, uh, you know, whether they're picture files. Let's just keep it on photography, okay? So what I want to be able to do is store that somewhere safely, and I want to be able to search for it when I need it. So who's putting the metadata on there, which is a big labor-intensive part of any of these? Okay, uh, that, that's so. automated. So basically, let's say you download a gigabyte worth of photos from your camera and you drop it in a folder, a sync folder, that sends it up to the virtual machine instance in, in the cloud. When new photos come into that folder, a batch process runs automatically that at this time will we'll write fixed data, whatever we've set up for your account, into the image metadata. So all that processing happens automatically. You're not doing that. And then from that point, those photos could be resized automatically to share to social media your website, have your uh, logo watermarked on it as well, moved into your cloud storage account, whatever you wanted. What I was talking about is more the descriptors. You want to search for a file full image, okay? And you've got a zillion folders files in there. So that kind of metadata, which is the time that's in the department, not the okay. copyright and all that stuff. So what you're talking about there is like machine intelligence <coughs> uh, oh, I mean, processing. Entry, really. Th I mean, that, that actually is kind of phase two that I want to get into. That doesn't exist at this point. Uh, that's part of the collaborative nature of this is my brother and his partner kind of going through their collection right now. So that would be manual at this point. But I don't know if you're familiar with the product uh, programming language called Wolfram Alpha. He has a specific uh, image identify clause, which probably be the, the next thing that I experiment with <coughs> to try to automatically categorize images in the, in the collection. But you're, you're at version 3.0 of my prototype. But yes, um, I, I realize that would be certainly a need for that. Um, and, and you probably, like some of the personal cloud storage accounts I've played with have features like that, like uh, Amazon Drive. Uh, I, I kind of up, uploaded a limited subset of this collection to Drive, uh, one, one, one cloud that's Microsoft saying, and Photos. And Amazon did a nice job of kind of finding faces and stuff like that. But it's still, you know, like my brother would be like, well, I want the genus and species of that bird. And it's, you know, with this stuff that's going to be well beyond the classification system. But that's where I would like to go. Yes, Eric. Uh, just to tweak on that a little bit. <clears throat> Pretty much almost Dropbox, Amazon, Lightroom, which I use. I mean, I've got 15 terabytes of photos and video for the last five years of my business. But everything, every one of those services now, as you import in some form or fashion, you can literally sit there at one time and go, Sunset, Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach, Virginia, blah, 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 cool bird. Batch, once done, take a sip of your coffee. Okay. Yeah, that's 
really you know, a very minimal thing at this point because all the storage programs have adopted it. So that would tear back to me. What is your niche then if, if he's talking about that? See, I don't know your world, especially in photography, so somebody else can kind of chime in. So that's my confusion point is it's great, um, great for the presentation, but is there really a market niche for it? You know, I just, I, that's where I don't really understand. Well, well, to come back to what Eric was saying, that is that is something, if you're, if you're talking about like adding a tag to a batch of photos, that is something this would be very well adapted to do. And also, like for example, as I, as I show watermarking your images, if you plan to distribute them on websites and stuff like that. So all of that automation and also making, you know, a lot of the cameras have settings that let you pre-program like author and stuff information, but if your system doesn't do that. Um, who this would appeal to, first off, you know, if you're dealing with large amounts of images, you either have some sort of on-site storage, okay, which is, which if you know anything about backups, you don't want, you know, just because you have a thing on one hard drive here and one hard drive here doesn't solve the problem because if somebody breaks into your studio, they're going to steal all that or if your house burns down, it all goes. So you need some sort of website storage. So it addresses that need because it can connect to any one of the major cloud storage services. And for example, if you wanted to have websites to serve uh, or images to serve your website and we're using Amazon Content Delivery Network or an S3 bucket, this automates that entire process. It'll resize them, watermark them, move them into your bucket, and do that all seamlessly without you having to do that. So it's gonna, one thing I would say is for anybody, it would eliminate a few steps in their daily workload. Um, yes? Sorry, it, I know you're in phase one. Right. It, the solution here is a little static at this point. Uh, once it's up there, if I need to change folders, if I need to restructure my information, uh, the administration of them, once they're there, changing the path, changing the metadata. Okay. Is that phase three? Or three? No, no, that all works right now. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a very super lazy person. So if somebody else has built something that already does all that, and you notice I'm very leaning very heavily on Google Drive here. Google Drive has built the entire front end that you're talking about. So let's say I wanted to um, have a bunch of images watermarked for a social media campaign, and I wanted to have a hash mark on all those images. So they're already up in the system. I could make a folder that has just a hashtag name, and remember, all the processing happens in the virtual machine instance in the cloud. So I just drag 10 images into that folder. They automatically get hashtag. Nobody has to do that. And they get shipped off to my social media team's folder. If I'm dragging any type of file between folders in Google Drive, they can be connected through the back end to any Google or Amazon cloud service. And I want to expand later, like uh, Azure and platforms like that as well. So basically, you can have someone on your team who's, who's you know, sending documents to deep archive storage and Amazon Glacier or whatever you want. Of course, Google Drive Unlimited also has Google Vault, so they're competing long-term storage. They, they could drag it into a folder, which then sends it to a, a different folder for a team who's enabled to have permissions to only view that content or only edit that content. Uh, individuals, because of Google Drive's permission settings, and also this is all managed with Google accounts as well. So if uh, nobody has access to stuff they're not supposed to have access to, somebody leaves your company, all you have to do is suspend their Google account. They never had the credentials for the cloud services, the virtual machine of the buckets, so you move one account, they're out of the whole system. I mean, that whole back end is already taken care of. Google did that, and they have much better engineers than I'll ever be. So I'm not going to write a website to do all that. So. Bill. I think you need to rethink your name. Yeah, that was, and, and, I, and the reason I say that, Mark, is when I see that simple archive service, there's no work, there's no photography in there at all. Uh, to me, that I, if I was searching for a photography service, I would skip over this because that that doesn't say anything to me. Okay. I think you need photography in there somewhere. Okay. Let me let me explain this, Bill. Let me back up a little bit. The very first slide, the simple archive service is the back-end framework. So, so I just had to come up with a name so when I'm talking to people about this, that's something to call it. Uh, a single Google Apps account organization can manage up to 600 domains. So I can create 
a service for YouTube video people, give it a domain name for that's attractive to YouTube video, name it a completely different thing, and manage it with the same back end that I used to manage any kind of service. So that this really, this isn't a marketing name. No, I'm not going to be selling the simple archive service to to photographers. Back office. That's right. This, this is the back end concept. So for photographers, I actually I actually tried to like. It. Uh, I registered the domain name Photo Drive Gallery. I thought I was being very clever, and I Googled it and didn't see anything. And then uh, the next day, I went back and Googled it and saw that I left a space out of it, and somebody has it as a trademark. So, moving forward, as we identify profitable target audience segments, we would then brand a service for that target audience. That is run. See, the beauty is it's all running on the same back end. So it's not like I have to reinvent the wheel every time I want to market to a different audience. So that that's not really what I would do. If you were a photographer, uh, I probably so this is really the, the name is really going to be almost invisible then. Yeah, like I said, I can manage 600 domains. This this domain right here, simplearchiveservice.com, is actually managed under markbank.net, and I can make you know 500 more domains, 500 more businesses, and run it all from the same. Admin back in. So, you know. Yes. So, uh, can you do it with? Uh, you kind of mentioned it, but you can do it with videos. I guess. Can you do it with other file types? Any, and any file type. Yeah. Okay. And the other question is: uh, You said that you copyrighted. Now, uh, is that the copyright information in the metadata, or do you have any other way of copywriting the files? Well. The, the batch process, <clears throat> if, if your camera or equipment doesn't automatically give you a place to update metadata, um, the batch process can update the image metadata, right? And I'm, I'm working so far only with JPEG images, so I need to experiment with other formats. Uh, also, it can put the watermark over the image like you saw it have kind of the semi-transparent thing or stuff like that. Right. It doesn't register your copyright. I mean, it, it, there's, a, I guess, an inherent copyright when you're the original artist. I don't, that answer your question? Kind of like, I, you know, Getty images, for example, if you put anything on Getty, uh, and then I think they have a method of implementing a certain code into the image file. That way, they can find you, actually. Yeah, So that, that is what I'm talking about. Um, okay. I mean, you know, that gets put in the metadata, and the metadata is part of the image. <clears throat> Where some people run into a little problem is they might use, like, uh, image management software on their computer, and sometimes the data that they're putting in associated with their file is actually a separate file that's not incorporated in the image. So when you you know, copy the files off somewhere, you're not really copying that information, but my system builds it into the image metadata. So whoever, so if somebody has your photo up on their website, you can download the image off their website, look at the metadata, and if they haven't been clever enough to wipe that, uh, you can go, you stole my picture. Like, oh, I was going to say, can they wipe like it? Maybe they crop out your logo in the corner and put it up, and you're like, no, it's in the metadata. So Correct. I mean, can they erase the metadata? Is it? Yes, metadata. That's a problem with metadata. It can be erased. It can be. Line. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. You mentioned that you're able to uh, create permissions. Is that sufficient for creating a client-side interface, or is it not intended to have a client-side interface? Is it just between collaborators? Okay. Um, first off. You know, Drive can be done. I'm kind of looking at Drive as also the client-side interface. So you can actually take a Google Drive folder and embed it in a website and have people just interact as, a, as view type permissions. Of course, if they're going to edit or manipulate images, they have to have edit permissions, which means they'd have to have a Google account. Um, what? There are a couple different ways you can do that. This would really. De this is how the system would be customized, maybe for the end user. If they're satisfied with just being able to display folders, uh, like an embedded folder in a website, then that's already built in. Uh, if they want to be able to serve images, say, to their website, you would probably either serve from a public bucket in Google Cloud Storage, or you would serve from an amp, like if you have a high traffic website, uh, you might want to serve from like Amazon S3 or Content Delivery Network. So there, there are different options to how the public facing side would be. Uh, something I want, I want to touch, I'm going to do a technical brief over at 1701 where I'm going to get into a lot of the, the other stuff, but actually Amazon has special kinds of buckets that you can actually monetize where people can actually purchase files out of a bucket. So, you know, depending on which cloud service you're sending it to, if you were talking about like people being able to purchase photos right off a website, 
that back end is already built in on Amazon's side, so we configure the service to make it so you can send photos to them. So you could actually have a standalone uh, membership website or something that you send your clients to where you're able to manage all this information on the back end, like maybe you have 50 photographers all around the world uploading photos. So they're uploading to regional buckets. You manage it all in Drive, and then you send it to whatever public or private source you want to. Okay. Now you can actually serve, you can actually embed a Drive image and serve it on a website. Um, so for low traffic websites, you can actually just, and all of Google's products have it set up so you can grab an embed an iframe for like calendars or images or whatever. So it can actually serve the images directly, it's just that it doesn't really work for high traffic websites. So, but if we just you know, put something together, yes sir. Are there any uh, search engine optimization advantages using your product? Okay. <clears throat> so, you, if you ever do anything with SEO, you know the SEO people are a very excitable bunch. And I was kind of in social media for a few years before that. So if, if when Matt Cutts was running that, if Matt Cutts even said anything, it would be like the next day there'd be 10,000 articles. Matt Cutts, you know, whatever, the groundhog came out with Google search is doing this. So there is the possibility, first of all, Google never tells you what exactly. They have supposedly 200 factors that get put into search. They're never going to really tell you the secret recipe because then you'd all just exploit it, wouldn't you? So um, he hinted at one point that image metadata could be used in Google image search. I believe in practice it's the file name and I think Google has their own kind of back-end machine intelligence that is trying to figure out what pictures are so when you type in search those images get returned. The actual metadata description, to my knowledge, at this time in history, is not actually used, but I think it would be, uh, one of the presentations I did was to a, a group of local realtors. I'm watching these guys just share a bunch of photos with no information on the images, no, you know, basically house for sale and stuff like that. So they're missing any opportunity <coughs> for social optimization or search optimization. So I would argue, and, and the system I demonstrated Took the entire listing description and put it in that image metadata description. You can put a lot of text in there. So when they shared it from Drive, anytime they shared to social media, it had like their contact information that was watermarked at the bottom of the image, all that kind of stuff. You know, I like all that. I'm, I'm thinking more like alt tags. You know, like when we, okay. like I wrote a blog yesterday about Tim Duncan and his ability to swim. And every single picture, like you write in the alt tag, like the, the keyword that you want. 